I'm Greg Jefferson. I'm the Metro Editor of the San Antonio Express News. This is Molly Smith, one of our ACE City Hall reporters. Uh, today, we are hosting the first in our series of one-hour live conversations with candidates for Mayor of San Antonio. Uh, as you all probably are aware, this race is off to an insanely early start. But given the problems and opportunities facing the city of San Antonio, I think we're well served by having a little extra time to really get to know uh, our candidates for mayor. Um, a lot is on the line in the upcoming election. By upcoming, I mean next May 3rd. <laughs> it's quite a ways away. Uh, so far, we've got uh, City Councilman John Courage. He's been in the race uh, for six months now. Uh, and Councilman uh, Manny Paulias, he's been in for three. Our guest today, Beto, Beto uh, Altamirano. He is the third person to formally enter the field. Uh, he is also the first candidate from outside of City Hall. Uh, he, in fact, uh, this is his first time seeking public office. Uh, Beto is the CEO and co-founder of Iris Technologies, which is an AI firm that develops apps that kind of make uh, make government services more accessible to residents. Uh, one of its products is a 311 app for the uh, city of San Antonio. Uh, we will ask uh, Beto to introduce himself in just a couple of minutes. Uh, and then we're gonna turn to your questions and we'll ask a few of our own. So if, if you wanna ask a question of the candidate, go to the bottom of your screen, hit the Q&A button, write out your question, and we will answer, or we'll, we'll try to get it, <laughs> as many of them as we can. But really, that's going to be up to Beto, uh, how satisfied you are with I'm going to try and keep <laughs> Yeah, just keep them. <laughs> right. Yeah. So, so, so welcome. Uh, thank you for joining us for this uh, first live event of the mayoral season. Um, or George, please uh, introduce yourself. Thank you, Greg and, and Molly, for, for doing this. Um, you know, you, you open the discussion uh, to the public uh, to be involved in this election cycle and to ask their questions. And, and by the way, like, I don't know what to expect, right? But I'm looking forward to, to the questions from the audience. And, and I hope that the answers are also engaging and informative mm -hmm. of my platform as a mayoral candidate in this election. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so a little bit about my background, uh, born and raised along the U.S.-Mexico border. I'm from Mission, Texas. I went to school at UT Austin uh, and chose San Antonio to start my company. Before starting my company, I spent uh, a lot of time working at the local, state, and federal level in government. Um, and that gave me the ability to formulate a theory of change for my technology company that, yes, developed the 311 SA product mm -hmm. uh, that impacted uh, many lives here in San Antonio. Today, that product is housed in a nonprofit that we launched as well, Better Futures, which I resigned uh, about a month ago, a month and a half ago, uh, to run for mayor. And uh, and today, the company, Iris, is actually doing cybersecurity and data analytics, uh, impacting the Department of Defense, especially on the cyber command mission efforts and, and desktop security, API protection, and also penetration testing. So um, it's fascinating. But this city gave me that ability, the ability to start this company and to... Um, to have the opportunity, right, to also employ uh, many folks here in San Antonio. And that's the same opportunity that I want to give back. How many employees do you have? We have about roughly 85 uh, team members counting uh, consultants, uh, part-time consultants. Um, and, 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 you know, I would say about almost 50% of them are based in San Antonio. Others are distributed throughout the country in different military bases. Um, and it's exciting, right? I mean, going from a smaller team, about 17 employees, um, mm -hmm. to now like that number of employees. Uh, and that's a San Antonio story, right? But I feel that that story uh, is out of reach for a lot of people. And uh, issues like public safety, economic development, uh, mm -hmm. infrastructure is impacting us in so many ways. And those are the same generational challenges that we face that require generational change. And I think my value proposition, right, as, a, as an outsider from City Hall is that as a business leader, uh, you put the right teams together. You go after the right uh, projects and you set a vision forward, momentum that you can achieve collectively. But it's also about building consensus among your peers. 
and uh, and that's what we need at City Hall as well. And I look forward to to uh, you know getting elected and, and getting to work because San Antonio we cannot play underdog anymore. We have so much talent. There's so much opportunity in this city. And when you look at San Antonio, San Antonio also sits in what is called the South Texas Triangle. And we need to explore the complexities in our economy here in South Texas in relationship with Austin because growth is happening. But I don't want to sacrifice San Antonio's identity for that growth. But I want to be prepared for that growth. And, and Molly, you spent time working in South Texas and you know the, the richness in culture that, that South Texas has, right? How do we leverage that culture that we have here in San Antonio and also start working with, uh, with other partners throughout the country, but also with, with countries like Mexico, like North Mexico, Monterrey. So that's part of my value proposition as well. Mm -hmm. It's been 20 years since San Antonio's elected a mayor who didn't have city council experience. Why are you running for mayor rather than first trying to win a council seat? Yeah, I know that I get that question asked all the time, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, I <laughs> yeah, yeah, which which I think, you know, is good. But I also in the process of people asking me that question, um, people are hopeful. People are excited. Just yesterday we had a a Northwest San Antonio listening tour stop. And there was this lady, Barbara, and um, she spoke up because it is a listening tour. So I'm giving the microphone to the attendees. And she said, you're a, you're a breath of fresh air in our politics. We haven't seen someone uh, it, that is not a career politician seeking uh, the mayoral seat, right? And that's important. And I think my, my value proposition is one of not being a career politician. Um, I don't think you need to be a council member first to be mayor. And that process has been disrupted across the country. And I don't subscribe to the wait your turn politics as well, especially if progressives are talking about wait your turn. It doesn't make sense. It really doesn't. Right. Here's the thing, you know, uh, elected officials like uh, Westmore out of Maryland. He didn't run for any state house position before running for mayor uh, for a governor. And now he's the governor of Maryland and he's doing an exceptional job. People like uh, like Donald Trump, you know, he ran for president. You know, he didn't go through the, you know, the, the mechanics or the or going through the Senate or or House or before running for president. And people like AOC, uh, she ran uh, Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez. She ran for Congress directly. She didn't run for state rep or a Senate before that. Uh, people like uh, Justin Bibbs, the mayor of Cleveland. He didn't do so either. He was actually a tech uh, employee. I'm a tech founder. I go beyond being a tech employee. And here's the thing. I don't subscribe to the wait your turn politics because our city cannot wait anymore to head in the right direction. We need a better future. We need a better jobs, better healthcare, better education for our city. And in my listening tour stops, I've been learning a lot about the challenges uh, that we're facing. And I think uh, the value proposition that I bring as, a, as an executive, um, as someone who is, I consider myself uh, a political entrepreneur in this scenario, uh, can actually fix those issues, right? And we can try. And I think as an entrepreneur, you take risk and you test ideas and you figure out what the pain points are in your community and the jobs to be done by the public policy, right? So going back to your question, I feel that uh, San Antonio is ready for change and I'm proposing change. But it's also being responsible with the idea that, that I, I understand that change is incremental. It's not going to happen overnight. I understand that. But in the process, we need to build consensus. And I guess like as, a, as an executive, as a CEO of a company, consensus is important. You need to spend time with your employees. You need to build vision forward for your company. You need to sell your board members on, on the idea of where your company is heading. And I think that's the same power that the mayor has. Mm. The mayor has the ability to leverage the bully pulpit to tell a story about San Antonio, of where we're heading, what are the issues that we are experiencing, and what are the projects that we need to get after. But also go out there and pitch and sell the city so that we can bring more industry to San Antonio while, while taking care of our own. Because our own is our identity, is who we are. And so it's a, it's a balancing act between growth and and taking care of our identity. But I think all those are the responsibilities of a mayor. And I think as, a, as an entrepreneur, a successful entrepreneur in the space of technology, someone who understands the complexities of how our world is changing due to technology, I can address those issues head on. 
And if you look at my track record as an entrepreneur, the technology tools that I've developed, the North Star of those technology uh, tools have always been with social impact in mind. The first product that we developed was the 311 SA product that has impact thousands of people in San Antonio. And we created efficiencies inside of the city of San Antonio that have not only benefited people in San Antonio, but we have improved the quality of life. And going back to the experience part, I spent a lot of time working in the Texas House of Representatives, in the U.S. Senate, and in the White House. But those were internships, right? Well, fellowships, yes, of course. But hey, let's not uh, play down the, the role of the interns. We have interns in the room right now, and they put in a lot of time. And they work some, sometimes they work for free. I woke up at five in the morning to go to the White House and get the press clippings done for the president, for the USTR. And so let's not diminish the role of the interns here, right? Uh, I also do fellowships, right? And I, I was a Bill Archer fellow for the UT system uh, program. And when I, when I graduated from college and I came back to, to Texas and chose San Antonio, I worked for two years in the Alamo area MPO. To be exact, a year and eight months, right? Because I mean, you're a journalist, so you, 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 you're gonna do your due diligence. So a year and eight months as a public involvement specialist, going around town, learning about transportation policy and issues that we faced in our community. And then as soon as I started my company, the first tool and, and platform that I developed was the 311 SA product. So if you look at my track record, it has always been about government, even if they were internships, Smalley. They have always been around the concept of how can we improve our government? How can we create efficiencies for government? How can we be public centric when it, com it comes to addressing the issues that we are facing in San Antonio? So that's my short, long response. <laughs> Assuming it's not possible to develop an app to just wipe out generational poverty and economic oh, yeah. segregation in San Antonio. How do you go about doing that? I mean, what's what's your plan? Yeah, so you've, you've mentioned poverty several yeah, times yeah, yeah, yeah. and you talk it frequently is. about generational po poverty. How do you address it? That's, that, that's my, I, I would say that's the number one issue that we're facing in San Antonio, hmm. poverty. 20% of uh, the population approximately. Yeah, 18. Uh, 18, 18%. Mm -hmm of the population is experiencing poverty in San Antonio. Mm -hmm. That should be worrisome. Uh, because of poverty, you have the, the ripple effects, right? That impact, for example, the crime activity in San Antonio um, and the broken window theory as well, right? Uh, related to infrastructure. I think when we talk about poverty, uh, what we need to also uh, talk about is uh, how do we reinvest in our communities? In the listening tour stops that I'm doing, I'm learning a lot about also generational disinvestment in parts of town, like the West Side, for example. What do you mean by disinvestment? Yeah, that we have not been intentional, right, in investing in those communities from infrastructure. You mean tax dollars going in? Yeah, absolutely. Services, absolutely. Or, or, or projects, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, like, like lack of sidewalks is mm -hmm. a big issue in the West Side, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and, and while... I know that that sounds basic. It directly connects, you know, to the idea of giving opportunity for, for folks that don't don't have those opportunities, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but I will say, I, I, I call it economic opportunity, not necessarily economic development. Mm -hmm. And and there's three areas that I want to focus on, right? Um, we need to train and we need to reskill and upskill our our youth in San Antonio, and not just the youth, mm -hmm. but also. Uh, folks from different age demographics uh, to be ready for industry 4.0 or the modern economy. The modern economy is going to be uh, highly dependent on technology. Mm. And my worry is this, that, uh, that, that that number, that percentage, 18%, is also correlated to the percentage of folks that don't have access to the internet in San Antonio which is almost like 18%, something like that as well, like 18, 20%. And I know we're making strides with SA Digital Connects, uh, but still, right? I mean, you have a, a large percentage of the population in San Antonio that doesn't have access to the internet or technology. So when I talk about reskilling and upskilling for Industry 4.0, the infrastructure has to be there for this to happen, but we have to get there. That's why part of my plan is to diminish the digital divide 1% every year, leading up to 10 years. If we can do that, we have more opportunity to train younger folks 
uh, with the skills necessary to fight the challenges of industry 4.0. And it's not necessarily to fight, it's to embrace the opportunities of technology. We should not be competing with AI. We should be leveraging the opportunities that we have in front with AI. And in the process, let's not forget as well uh, how trade jobs are not going to go anywhere, right? Trade jobs are here to stay. My dad, he's an HVAC mechanic. Uh, and I know AI is not going to replace his job, for example. But what I get excited about is also the trade jobs of the future. Think about EV chargers and the implementation of EV chargers across the U.S. Uh, President Biden wants to deploy thousands of EV chargers in the country. But we don't have the manpower to actually deploy them because the skills are not there necessarily, right? So when I talk about the industry 4.0 jobs, I also refer to trade jobs that we can train here in San Antonio. But again, let's not ignore the conditions to get that training done, which is the, the digital divide that needs to be addressed. My second point would be attracting emerging enterprises to San Antonio. We already have two emerging trends in our economy. We have uh, cybersecurity and we have biotech or bioscience. Cybersecurity, 17,000 of 55,000 technologies already work in cybersecurity. In bioscience or healthcare, one in six individuals already works in that space. I feel we need to do more to attract more emerging enterprises mm. to those two trends in our economy. The cybersecurity world is popular in San Antonio, not necessarily because we're going out there and pitching this idea of cybersecurity. But rather, we have JBSA. We have a strong military presence. But, you know, we've been here yeah. before, though. Yeah. I mean, the talk of attracting more tech goes back, at this point, generations. Yeah. <laughs> and it's it's really not taken hold. I mean, the tech district that was created downtown and kind of anchored in yeah. them, it really, you know, it's it's failed to kind of reap the results, you know, it hoped. Uh, how would you do anything differently? But, well, I'm, I'm, because I'm not talking about building a tech district. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm talking about attracting uh, I just, enterprises yeah, I mean, like, on their own, right? I and, and, that's and, one way, well, one strategy. Well, yeah, absolutely. But here's the thing, Greg. I mean, yeah. we already have Port San Antonio, right? Mm -hmm. um, my client, you know, with, with Iris is a cyber command mission. Right. And so uh, I know there's already a strong presence at Port San Antonio of cybersecurity firms. My, my, my point is not about building this dreamland of technology in San Antonio. Mm -hmm. I don't even consider uh, technology to be its own sector. Technology is already in every sector. Right. In journalism, technology, this right here, this moment, right? We're using podcasts, uh, live TV, every, this is technology driven, mm -hmm. right? So when I think about tech, right, I, I think about technology in every aspect of industries across San Antonio. So I don't, I'm, not, I'm not talking about this dreamland of right. having a tech district. I'm talking about bringing businesses that can employ people here in San Antonio mm -hmm. that doesn't require too much training, that requires maybe two-year uh, training programs, right? Mm -hmm. Cybersecurity doesn't require you too much training. If you can uh, go through a program that is uh, even, uh, uh, let's say, three, four months programs that can enable more participation from the community in these two industries. Now, I'm not an expert on, 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 on bioscience. I spoke a lot about uh, cybersecurity, right. but I know we have a lot of experts in San Antonio that are dying to get a chance to contribute to the idea of economic opportunity and development that come from the, the bioscience space. Mm -hmm. So I, what I'm saying is, is we need to bring more industry to San Antonio and taking care of those uh, communities that have been underserved as well. And I know ready to work as a, uh, was a good start, but- Yeah, but, yeah. a lot of what you said about training is applicable to to ready to work. Yeah. So it sounds like, I mean, just on the face of it, I'd have to say you're a supporter of ready to work. Do you, uh, wait, 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 wait. Uh, wait. <laughs> hey, don't put I, words I, in my I, mouth. I do, yeah, I do not want to don't put words, put words in, your in my mouth, mouth. Look, especially no, no, when no, it comes no, to look. ready to work. Trust me. No, look, I, I, I am supportive <laughs> right. of the idea. Yeah. And at North Star behind Ready to Work SA. What do you what do you take that to be? I, what, I take in that, your that, view, the, like what, yeah, what was yeah, that the, program the, supposed to be? The, the training, right? It's the noble cost. A hundred and ten percent. I get behind that. Yeah. Yes, I'm all about it, right? Now the mechanics of it, right? Uh how we are going about training, maybe where I would like to see is more uh, involvement, you know, from the private sector. W what I would like to see with that program is 
the jobs, mm -hmm. right? The results, the outcomes. What I would like to see is us training with the the idea of, of finding an outcome in the form of jobs, right? I feel like governments and economic development entities um, are in charge of diversifying the skills that people have in different regions of the country, specifically, we're talking about San Antonio, right? right? We have a multiple set of skills here in San Antonio. Mm -hmm. What I would like to see is a ready to work essay and other economic development endeavors in San Antonio, like Greater SATX, mm -hmm. to focus on diversifying those skills in the form of outputs that are jobs, goods, and services. Mm -hmm. And I think when I talk about uh, cybersecurity and, and bioscience, it's not that I want to go back to that topic, but I'm bullish that those are trends that we have in our economy, sure. right? So that's where, where I think uh, Ready to Work SA should head on, right? Now, talking about Ready to Work SA, uh -huh. there's there's a, a big issue that, that we keep hearing from the community, right? And that is childcare. Mm. Like every listening tour stop that we've had, uh, childcare keeps coming up. Mm. So where I envision also ready to work as a evolving is a component where you train childcare professionals, number one, and you also provide the ability, right, or funding to um, to revamp a childcare program in right. San Antonio, maybe with pre-K for SA or um Avance is also very interested in this topic of childcare. But I see childcare as a tremendous opportunity in San Antonio that we have not really tapped into. And I know there's going to be 15, well, the 15 schools, SA, San Antonio IC schools are closing. What if we can also rehab three or four of them that, that have really good bones and structure for childcare facilities? Yeah. So th those are the ideas yeah, if, that I see for, for ready to work. Yeah, if, if I can just cut in. Uh, we've evolving. had several viewers asking about yeah. whether you support ready to work or not. Um, and I think it, it, the program is top of mind is because it's, you know, it is it is the largest job training program any American city yeah. has ever attempted. But it's also a troubled program and its placement. Uh, and I, I think that might be why some yeah. of our viewers are asking. Absolutely. Uh, it's got, you know, it it, ha it struggles to place uh, program graduates into good paying jobs. And that has yeah. been that has been a, a chronic problem. This is a 400 and plus million, 400 plus million dollar tax program. Uh, and it will end that 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 tax will you know stop going to ready to work in a couple yeah, of years. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. how, assuming the 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 program is as it is, if you're elected, how do you how do you fix it? Yeah, yeah. So I mean, I, I spoke about different endeavors, right, on, right. on fixing yeah, yeah. it, right. I mean, being more uh, collaborative with the private sector, for right. example, right. Uh -huh. um, what does that look like? Because I mean, I think that's been the city's yeah. goal all along: is we want this investment from private from the private sector. So what are you going to do differently that the city is, is maybe trying to do? So I, I spoke into a lot of small businesses in San Antonio and, and also some, some of our bigger firms in San Antonio. We got to be training for the jobs of the future or the jobs that are in demand in terms of industry. And we're not doing that enough. Right. I mean, we can talk about it, but we need actionable items. What do I mean by that? What are the jobs that USAA actually needs, for example, right? Uh, or the skills that they're looking for. Um, we need to be training to the skills that are in demand by these enterprises that are in San Antonio. So that that would be number one. And, and I will say, look, and, and when I'm researching this with small business uh, owners as well, uh, what I what I've learned to come, you know, to find out is that. Uh, sometimes the program lacks uh, effective communication with some of the small business uh, businesses in San Antonio or employers. Uh, it almost seems like they give them a CSV file and it's like, here's like, you know, the skills and the people that you could contract or you could hire. Imagine if we have a, a program that is more tailored to the needs of small businesses in San Antonio, especially in the healthcare system, for example, or, you know, the, the major enterprises as well. And we start training towards those skills that are in demand in San Antonio. And I think that's the one of the immediate changes that I would like to see. Um, and, and of course, again, I go back to these two industries, cybersecurity and bioscience. I, that's another focus area that I would like to see. And then finally, childcare. I think I would love to incorporate uh, a childcare into this uh, plan of action. Uh, ready so to ready to work is a huge issue and it could eat up our entire- Yeah, I know, I know. So, I know, I know. so I think I'm going to move on. But, but I, uh, I think, yeah, yeah it's clear it, on the three areas that I, uh, how I will improve it. You got it. 
All right. So uh, Diego, who's one of our viewers, he wants to know, it's a very good question. Uh, where do you stand on uh, increasing council, city council pay yeah. and pay for the mayor? And eliminating term limits um, and pay caps on the city manager. And Molly, you can give us some background on yeah. those. Yeah. So as you know, the council in the next few weeks is going to be deciding which charter changes they're going to ask voters to approve in November. Among them are doing away with the caps on the city manager that voters actually put on in 2018. It restricts the city manager to making no more than what, 10 times what the lowest paid employee makes and uh, not being in the yeah. post for more than eight years. And in terms of council pay, they're floating ideas of anywhere. It's right now about 46,000, raising it maybe 58, or the Charter Commission actually wants it to be closer to 80. So yeah. kind of where where do you stand on both Molly, of Molly, what's the average uh, uh, the income in San Antonio? Do you have that data? So the median income for the city is about 58,000. 58, and what are council members getting paid today? About 46,000. Yeah, so I think that's wrong, right? I think that we should increase, we should index the the increase of salary to the medium uh, income in San Antonio. Uh, and I would advocate, right, that for the mayor as well, right? Um, now, the the immediate numbers that we saw that came out of council were, were um Really high, in my opinion. Or that came out of the charter. Yeah, the bit, charter. But... What were they like? Uh, <laughs> it was, and... Yeah, it was over a hundred thousand. Yeah, for I mean, the mayor. Yeah, yeah. I just, I just struggle with right. that. Right. Yeah. I mean, when, when yeah. you know, you have families throughout uh, San Antonio that are uh, trying to survive. Don't tell Bear County commissioners yeah. because know, make, right? make, how, how, how much do they make? Wait, how much do they make? Actually? It's over about uh, hundred forty. Yeah, yeah. 150? Oh, 150, 000. How, many, how many times a month do they make? Uh, Two twice. 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 They have two regular meetings, and then I'm sure and they don't have like the meetings that city council members have. Uh, not, not enough. Not enough. Right. Yeah. I mean, so so look, so I, you're I clearly not running for county judge. <laughs> so got it. Okay. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not. Look, I mean, uh, no, but I think they do amazing work, right, at the county as well, and, and our commissioners are uh, doing excellent work. I would like to say maybe, maybe but let's more collaboration. <laughs> with the but I'll say this, right? Um, I, I am for a salary increase for council members. We need the best talent. But I want to index the salary to the medium income of San Antonio. Uh, even, you know, there, there could be a threshold uh, that could be a bit higher. Right. Uh, but I'm not um, interested in supporting something that is, uh, you know, that where the salary is too high. Right. Where it's above way and beyond than the medium income of San Antonio is because I don't think it's fair. Right. This is, uh, you know, public service should be uh, a noble calling for you. Right. And and although. Uh, it's easy to, for me to say that, right, as an entrepreneur, because I know that some of our council members, this is their full time job right now. And and when I go into, uh, you know, uh, becoming a, a, a if I get elected, uh, this is going to be a full time job for me and I'm going to resign from my company. Right. Uh, and and I struggle with the idea that we're not getting we, we're not going to get the best talent if people are struggling to, um, you know, pay their rent, to pay their mortgage. Uh, in council, right? And so I would say, yes, index the salary to the medium income, maybe even a, high, a bit higher threshold uh, of salary. Uh, but that's where I stand on, on salary. Now, in, in term limits... Um, for the city manager. For the city, well, but first, uh, let's talk about the city council uh, term limits. Um, yeah, because they're also thinking of bumping it up. It's a two-year limit now, oh, bumping four. it up to a four-year and capping it. At yeah, so... so it's, it's complicated. It's very complicated decisions, right? But I'll say this. Um, the idea stands from the fact that you only got two years to serve if you're a city council member. And so you get in, I mean, you're campaigning, you get in and you have less than a year to enact policy, uh, you know, to build your team, et cetera. And then you're going to be campaigning again. And some of the, uh, the thoughts and ideas that I hear from the community uh, stand from the fact that some of the council members uh, need to be fundraising and need to be at events and they do not prioritize uh, serving the public, right? There's a formula in political science called uh, members of Congress are constant seekers of re-election. And that formula applies uh, to council members because it's a two-year term, right? And so what that formula tells you, right, is that council uh, members of Congress need to be fundraising almost like 40, 50 percent of their time. And that trickles down to uh, the local uh, space here with council members. And so I see the challenge on that front However, right, we've seen some uh, events happen, you know, to put it that way, in our council, uh, where the public 
has made the decision to vote some of the those council members that uh, have not had uh, good experiences in City Hall, to put it in a nice way, to vote them out, right? And so I struggle with that. So I would say I, I, I wouldn't want to increase the term limit to four years. So you want to keep it at a two-year Yeah, I feel comfortable with two years. Uh, we've done it in the past, and, and we should continue to do so. Now, uh, idealistic, being idealistic, I agree with the idea of four years. I see it. But, you know, I've been discouraged. As not not as a, as a career politician or a council member right now, as as a, as a resident of San Antonio, I've been discouraged with some of the things that I've seen in City Hall, and I love that our electorate, our residents, you know, go go down to the voting booth and they make the decisions to either keep hiring this person or let them go. And then, real quick, what's your stance on whether you would want to undo the? term and the salary cap on the city manager. Yeah, that, that one's a tough one too, right? When we talk about salary for the city manager, you know, we are under the threshold of salary across the U.S. Uh, you know, other cities are paying their, their city managers uh, way more, right? And so I worry about the type of talent that we can keep in San Antonio or welcome to San Antonio. Uh, I understand the complexities of why the cap uh, was put in you know, with uh, with the previous city manager, and 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 I, I know Greg covered all those stories, uh, so you can look them up on, on, on or, or just remember them, or yeah. just remember them. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I think there's even books about it, right? So I understand that, but I, I think it's up to the city uh, council to make the decision to either fire uh, or keep the the city manager. That's how I feel right now. Now things think I mean things might evolve, right? I'm formulating my theory of change, but but, I, but I'm giving you I'm giving you that response right now, right? So I, I don't want to put a cap right now on the city managers. Uh, to, but you, it's what, what's your stance on whether there should even be a cap? No, that there shouldn't be. There a should cap. be a okay. cap, okay. Yeah, and also so, with salary, I don't think we, we we should we should index the salary uh, based on the performance though of the city manager. That is something that I am pro and that I want to advocate on, right? And uh, and we need to be public also about the performance of the city manager. But I am for increasing the salary of the city manager, but it has to be indexed mm. on the performance of the city manager. That's how I feel. Okay. So I was very transparent and clear on my right. decision. The the business community, I think, has been the staunchest, uh, they've been the staunchest advocates for eliminating the term limits on the city manager. And I think I think it really has to do with their support of city manager Eric Walsh. In your view, is Eric Walsh worth the money? Uh, I think he's a great operator. Mm. I really think he's a good operator. Um, but I also think that uh, we need a council, a council, and we need we need a, a mayor moving forward uh, that also dictates vision. You can have an operator dictating vision as well, right? Mm -hmm. And I think uh, what we've seen uh, from City Hall, uh, we came out of COVID, and I think Mayor Ron Ember did an exceptional job in mm -hmm. balancing uh, the wins and the and the challenges of COVID. I mean, he did an exceptional job. I really do think so. Moving forward, right, uh, he's a lame duck uh, mayor today, right? Uh, and I think Ready to Work SA was one of his priorities that he led as a, as a legacy project for San Antonio. But moving forward, uh, what I want to see is more vision come out of city council. And I want uh, council members to start collaborating with each other mm -hmm. and to have a more unified front. And, and communication is key. Um, building consensus is key. And that vision needs to come from the mayor and the council. And that's how you influence a great operator. And in this case, I think Eric is a great operator, but we need great vision coming from council members and the mayor. If we don't have that, uh, and the mayor is, uh, well, the city manager, sorry, is dictating vision as well, uh, that's where I, it, it becomes problematic. But I think Eric, he's, he's a great operator. Right. Now we've gotten several questions on Project Marvel, which is, um, it's, a plan that city officials are developing for a downtown sports and entertainment district that could wind up costing three to four billion dollars and it might include a new, yeah. new Spurs. Yeah, yeah. So we've gotten a lot of interest and a lot a lot of our viewers really want to know, uh, would you support uh, public financing first yeah. to go uh, to toward the construction of okay. a new arena for the Spurs? And second of all, or generally for this this kind of mega entertainment district. Yeah. So look, I mean, the beauty of the Spurs is that no matter where you live, in what part of town, no matter um, your background, you know, you celebrate 
the the Spurs. That's the beauty of uh, of sports, and the Spurs are are part of our identity, and and I love that about San Antonio. Uh, I get excited when the season starts and you know going to the games and supporting the Spurs and even here in this room, there's a couple of people with Spurs hats, right? And so that's the beauty that that's that's part of our identity, the Spurs. Now I, I worry about you know what happened in the East Side. I really do. Um, I feel there were some promises that were made. And, and we're talking about the the construction of of the uh, Frost Bank Center. Uh, when this went to a public vote, this was a county tax, a visitor tax. And uh, officials involved in the campaign will say we never promised anything. But th- I think there were implicit promises that there would be yeah. some economic rejuvenation in the area. So, so and, and it never happened. And so, like, I do want to revisit those conversations. Right. Yeah. Uh, first of all, and I know that. But I mean, what does that mean? Yeah, that we should publicly uh, talk about, you know, some of the um, concepts that were debated yeah. that were going to impact economically the east side, mm-hmm. uh, and where are the outcomes or results of those endeavors that we publicly acknowledge before we built the Frost Arena. That's what I refer to. Now, second, I would say, and I know this is very uh, basic, but I, I, I speak to uh, Commissioner. Uh, Commissioner Tommy Calvert, and he talks about how uh, the cones, you know, you leave the, the arena and there's cones that don't let you explore the rest of the east side. I know that's very simple, very uh, basic, but those are the type of conversations that we also need to talk about. Right. And so my 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 challenge with this concept is um, what are the outcomes for the east side? Mm-hmm. Uh, what are some of the plans or efforts that we're going to put forward? So that we continue to economically stimulate the side. Uh, now let's bring it to downtown, right? With the question, which is this purse arena. Um, I think sport districts are exciting, right? Especially in a city that is growing. Uh, and I think the, the sports district in downtown uh, could have a, tremendo, a tre- tremendous impact in all the small businesses across downtown. I know several uh, business owners in proximity uh, to the Hemisphere Park that are excited about the concept. Uh, some of them are bar owners, restaurant owners, and they are extremely excited about the potential of the Spurs Arena in downtown. They worry, though, that the capital improvement projects, which are blocking <laughs> many of the streets, are, are going to put a burden on their right. uh, potential opportunities and by, and by to stay way, open for the next four years. Is that an argument against uh, Eric Walsh being <laughs> such a great operator? I think he's a... The, look, the fact I mean, that the city struggles to do well, three projects well, that, that don't harm businesses. I, I, I think that you know we had a, 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 a more uh, consistent vision coming out of City Hall and putting more pressure on the city manager. Mm-hmm. Uh, the operation factor of Eric Walsh doesn't go anywhere. He's a, a good Good operator. That's mm-hmm. what I meant. But you know, we need pressure on the operator. I, look, I'm a CEO in my company. Right. The, the the board puts pressure on me, and I yeah. act right. Yeah. So so th- th- those are two different things, Perfect. right? Yeah. Your, your skills. I, I divert. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Should, yeah, yeah. yeah. Those are your skills as an right. operator, and your skill, and, and and you know the, the type right. of goals and metrics and KPIs, key performance indicators that you need, you need to address as an operator. So those yeah. are two different conversations, right? Okay. Going back to uh, the comment about the, the Spurs Arena downtown, uh, I will say this, Greg. Look. I, I am supportive of the idea. I am mm-hmm. uh, being uh, almost 35. I turn uh, 35 next month. I I, I, I struggle with the challenge of, of, you know, good quality of life in the downtown area. And we must protect our downtown also from crime as well. Uh, but I feel that that having a sports district is exciting. Mm-hmm. You know, when I welcome people from outside of Texas to San Antonio and I take them to the Frost uh, Stadium, uh, they're usually puzzled by the fact that it's so removed from the downtown area. Right. Imagine if you can walk to the arena or you can take a, a bike to the arena and then you can have dinner in one of the restaurants nearby. So, yes, I'm, I'm all for it. But here's the thing. I struggle with the public uh, funding component. Mm-hmm. How much is that going to come from taxpayers uh, dollars? Right. That's I want to I want to revisit that right and and really and by revisiting uh, there's not enough information out there for me to to come up with with a response in terms of the of the public dollars. That would be, I mean, but, but no, I would like I, I would like for this to be mostly uh, privately funded, mm-hmm. and if there's a, a chunk of money, so more than half. That, that yes, so that would be ideal, right? No. And and if there's a component where uh, taxpayer dollars have to be utilized. Uh, we need to make a, a decision, and that would be an investment on behalf of the public in an arena that is going to be theirs as well. And by that, I mean we need to uh, make sure, right, that uh, 
that the conditions are there for pu the public to have access to the arena, right? And by that, I mean, how are they going to get there, right? So public transportation should be a priority, right? Uh, even parking as well. Like we need to think about all the components mm -hmm. that are going to allow the majority, if not everyone in San Antonio, actually, to have access to that uh, arena. Because if we're building the arena for just a few of us, right, here in San Antonio, it's not gonna work out, right? Mm -hmm. And and we should not use any taxpayer dollars for that. Right, so um, owners should pay majority of it. So more than more than half, that's one condition. Uh, the, the condition, I, I'm still defining that. Okay. So uh, Greg, I don't wanna give you a, a percentage. I'm not trying to block you. I know, I know, I know, I know what you're saying. More than half, I, I'm still, I'm just, I, like, I just wanna know where you stand yeah, yeah, yeah. On, on public financing going Absolutely. Forward. And my, my response, professional sports. Are, yeah, my response yeah. would be uh, a, a large percentage, right? right? It can be in, yeah. in the 30 to 50 that, to 60. But would, uh, would that be, would your support for any kind of public financing, would it be contingent? You'd mentioned, hey, you've got to, you've got to, you've got to make things right on the east side. Yeah. Right. Like there were, there were implicit promises made and they weren't kept. And something, the city, I'm assuming that's what you mean, has to do something. Absolutely. Is it, I mean, so would your support for public financing be tied to you know some plan for the east side i could see that happening yes i mean that that sounds something that i would be uh invested and supportive of right but here's the thing i mean the the mechanics of that happening is it's complex right like that sounds very idealistic right uh -huh. so um so i i, I want to benchmark you know the, yeah. the pe taxpayer dollars upon how much private funded funding can be achieved, right? Mm -hmm. uh, we saw that with the missions, right? The missions are are being uh, largely funded by by the private sector, right? right. Uh, I would like to see more of that for this first conversation, right? Uh, but then again, uh, we also collectively, as a community, as San Antonians, we need to make an investment, right? And if that's gonna improve our quality of life, let us look at the data. Let us look at the, their plan of action their development plans as well. How is their uh, infrastructure development plans going to disrupt also downtown in the process? If the capital improvement projects, which are happening outside of this building, right. are disrupting so many businesses. Yeah. Are, and by the way, I'm glad you were able to make it across Broadway without yeah, getting hit by a car. I know. So. Which, by the way, like, you can walk <laughs> in the streets, right? Right. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, it's, it's, yeah. it's, we, we, we need see to, it every day. We see that every day. So, <laughs> so you know, going back to... Um, the vision forward for the, the Spurs Arena, I would like to see a plan of action and how that is also going to disrupt uh, infrastructure development in downtown. Now, the, the cities, and one more question, we'll we'll because yeah, 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 yeah. uh, got a lot of ground to cover still. Uh, so the city in its planning for, you know, this the Spurs Arena, but also the, the broader uh, sports and entertainment district, has been happening effectively in secret like they've every party they've talked to every consultant they've they've been in touch with they've placed under uh non-disclosure agreements they're making the city is making a very aggressive use of ndas um is that right maybe that's a loaded question yeah yeah is, yeah, is, yeah, is, yeah. is uh, that the way to conduct public business look i i i understand the the narrative. I understand why they're doing so, right? Mm -hmm. uh, if you why think, you, because if you think of, of the city as an enterprise, right? Mm -hmm. um, decision making, when it's done, uh, when you have a, a lot of influence, a lot of voices, when making decisions, uh, they cannot only get watered down, mm -hmm. but the efficiency of an outcome of a decision uh, sometimes doesn't get. We don't get that outcome, right? Mm -hmm. And so I understand, you know, where they're coming from. Uh, but I would like for them to be more public about it. I think that the, the public of San Antonio deserves that, right? And so, um, yes, maybe maybe uh, the mechanics, the logistics, the day-to-day -day activities behind negotiations, behind uh, the, the the decisions that are being made. Like I get it. Like maybe you can advise the public that hey, you went for coffee with this person right immediately. But imagine if you had updates, monthly updates, and that you were transparent. Right. Uh, with the type of decisions that are taking place. And those updates can come from behalf of the, the mayor or the city manager. That's something that I can subscribe to. Absolutely. Uh, but yes, more transparency is needed. One hundred percent. Greg. Yes. Now, let me. Uh, this is this is far off sports and entertainment. Far off. A question from Patricia. Our city and county have some of the highest numbers 
in uh, domestic violence yeah. cases, child abuse, elder abuse, and elder domestic abuse. How will you address this dire concern in the midst of San Antonio Familias? Yeah, that's a big issue. And we've heard about it uh, from our listening to stops. Um, it's not easy. It's not easy. Right? It's complicated. Um, but I would say this. When I, I think about the investment that we need to make in these communities, right, that are experiencing uh, these issues, uh, we should also talk about uh, public safety as a whole, right? Um, the safety of our residents should be the number one priority of elected officials. And child abuse, um, elderly abuse, the gun violence that is happening in our city, which is out of control. Uh, we need to address it head on. But also think about how public safety entities need to be more collaborative with communities to get to the root cause of some of the issues that we are experiencing, like you mentioned right now. And by that, I mean, we need more community-oriented policing, for example. Um, when I think about community-oriented policing, I think about, uh, for example, SAFE, which is an initiative from SAPD. And I think I was just having a conversation yesterday with this gentleman. His name is Joey Cipriano. He represents the Thompson uh, neighborhood or formerly represented the Thompson neighborhood. And he was telling me how um, public safety entities need to build more ties with the community of San Antonio to understand the challenges that are that they are experiencing from child care, from child, sorry, child abuse to elderly uh, abuse to gun violence, et cetera. And, and he said, my strategy is simple. For the safe officers, I invite them to have a Mexican Coke in my porch. And I start telling them everything that is happening with my neighbors and the challenges that they're experiencing. And in the middle of those conversations, the issues like child abuse or elderly abuse are presented to these type of officers, right? Because their goal is to build ties with the community. And I think the program is working but we need more of it in San Antonio. We need to train our public safety uh, representatives uh, with the right training, right? To build those ties with the community. And, and I think uh, community oriented uh, policing could be a way to identify uh, crime from happening uh, again, or to prevent crime. I think of it as a proactive way to address the root causes of the problems that we're facing uh, related to public safety, right? versus a reactive approach. We cannot police our way out of crime. And so I think community building is important for every public safety entity. And this addresses the concerns of, of child abuse, elderly abuse, gun violence. I mean, you get to get to the, you have to get to the root cause of what is happening. And we can't do it by just reacting and showing up late to fix the issue uh, from someone who has been abused, et cetera. Do you have other proposals for reducing gun violence, particularly downtown? You're a district one. Brother, yeah, yeah, yeah. Near downtown. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I, I walk the Riverwalk every day, right? That's a form of exercise. I run the Riverwalk. I walk uh, at least five, seven miles. If you see me on the Riverwalk, say hi to me. <laughs> Let's have a, a coffee. Um, look, I, I think that uh, crime is up. It feels like it, right? Uh, the data shows that crime is down. Right. Uh, but it doesn't feel like it. Mm -hmm. And that's the challenge, the perception of it. Right. It doesn't feel like crime is down. So when I when we talk about like solutions, right, I think about um, problem oriented policing. Problem oriented policing looks at the data. Um, and that's what the city is doing right now. Yeah. With hotspot, with hotspot policing. Plan. But we need more of it. Right. And and I what feel, does that look like? You've talked about like we need more of it. We need more safe options. No, no, no. But, 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 but look, and by more of it on the safe side, right? I, more training of officials and also incentivize uh, public safety representatives or officers to go through the program of safe as a way to rank up in leadership inside of SAPD. That's what I mean by more of it. That we are more intentional about having officers go through the program of SAFE because we're providing incentives in the form of supporting their curriculum, who they are as professionals, and ranking up through the through the SAPD uh, pro, uh, 
enterprise organization. And so that's what I mean by more of it, right? And by hotspot policing, let's deploy more technology. I know that Trish DeBerry is looking into uh, cameras uh, for the, the market downtown, right? Because of the gun shootings. There's, there's applications to technology that we can do. And when I say we need more of it, when we talk about hotspot policing, there's there's unlimited type of applications in terms of technology that we can deploy. But here's the thing, right? Uh, data data is only going to tell us so much, right? What is really going to help us, right? I go back to community-oriented policing, is the anecdotal data that is coming from the public. So if our police officers, so, so let's connect the problem-oriented policing with community-oriented policing. If, if they are not collaborating, right, the hotspot policing efforts and the safe uh, policing efforts, then we're not going to have a great outcome in addressing the root cause of why we have gun violence in San Antonio. And look, by the way, we have to be bullish on our support for the men and women in blue uniforms. We have to support SAPD. And, and every organization has bad apples every organization, but let's not have those bad apples define the narrative of who SAPD is, number one. Number two, I would say this, um, it, it feels like tourists in San Antonio, right, are, are becoming afraid or, or scared of, of downtown San Antonio. And so I wish that we had more public safety uh, presence at the Riverwalk, for example, right? Uh, gun violence should not be uh, deter uh, tourists from coming to San Antonio. The, the hospitality industry in San Antonio represents about $19 billion, according to Visit San Antonio. This was recorded in 2022. Imagine if, if that number keeps crumbling down because less tourism happens in San Antonio because of our public safety concerns. So we have to get tough on crime. And so I gave you very clear examples on what that more, you know, quote unquote, more looks like. Now, it, you'd mentioned the possibility of, you know, maybe increasing police presence downtown. We've had a spate of, of fatal shootings since since April. Like, How do you feel about those shootings, Greg? Because, I mean, you, you, you work in the area, right? How do you feel about that? Uh, I mean, honestly, I, I, I do feel safe, but I just walk one block to my parking lot. I, I'm not all over downtown, but this is not about me. Uh, no, yeah. but, but you say something critical, right? Uh -huh. uh, although there's a perception, right, uh, that crime is up and and it feels like unsafe. And and, uh -huh. and the Express News, by the way, is covering all these stories on gun violence. Right. When I travel to other parts of the world, in some areas, I feel more unsafe. Mm -hmm. I was just texting with a friend, uh, Jordan, and we're and I and he asked me, "How do you feel about that?" I feel safe. Uh -huh. So we still have a great quality of life, but we have to be proactive. In, that, in making sure that this quality of life doesn't disappear in San Antonio. Well, what about a north or a west side neighborhood? So the, the, you know, with violent crime, you know, they they might hear you, you know, calling for an increased police presence downtown and say, why not my neighborhood? Well, because you asked about downtown. Right. Marley asked specifically a okay. about downtown. And that's yeah. why my, my response was focused on downtown. But this goes for every part of the city. We are a sprawling city, right? Uh -huh. And and the type the, the issues that are happening downtown are happening in the north side, are happening on the west side and the east side. The the shooting was near uh, of this woman, uh, the coach who was visiting, yeah, uh, close to the St. Paul. It, it was yeah. it was towards the east side, right? Yeah. So these issues are happening across town. So we we need to address them with yeah. the same two concepts that I mentioned that the C, that the SAPD is already doing. Mm -hmm. But uh, we need to be uh, more intentional, right, in how we invest more into these two programs, right? So it goes for every part of the city, not just mm -hmm. downtown. Yeah. Are you talking about uh, changing, uh, in some way, funding for SAPD to give it more money for, no, for community maybe policing? Maybe redirect, hiring more re redirecting, cops, maybe redirecting some of the funds that we uh, already have, uh, understanding, you know, doing uh, a review, right, of some of the programs that are uh, more efficient than others. Hmm. Uh, are we talking about SAPD programs? SAPD, SAPD. I mean, I, I would be interested in seeing how uh, the funding, you know, can be redirected, right? I think the funding that the SAPD already receives is a large percentage of our budget. So I'm not saying increase the budget at all. I just want to be clear on that, right? right. Uh, what I'm saying is how do we redirect, redirect some of the funds that the city has, uh, that SAPD has uh, to target some of the programs that are actually being more proactive mm -hmm. on fighting crime, right? right. And, and, and look, I don't have all the answers, right, Greg? Mm -hmm. uh, I need to do more diligence. I have to do more research on right. the subject matter. But I think as mayor, right, what you do, you collectively build the right teams. 
and you collaborate, you bring people to the table, you have the conversations and the difficult ones too. Right. And that's what I intend to do. Yeah. Just a quick question about you'd mentioned Trish DeBerry. She's the CEO of Centro San Antonio. It's kind of the guardian of downtown San Antonio. They're talking with the uh, the city of San Antonio about an integrated uh, security camera system yeah. with facial recognition yeah. capability. Yeah. Would you be and you sounded you liked you like the idea. I mean, I, when you add facial recognition technology, do you still like the idea? I mean, I I, I need to do more diligence uh -huh. on, on what how the technology looks like, right? Uh, as a technologist, I would say this, right? Um, we have to be worried about um, how the data, right, and the technologies that are being uh, driven by AI are gonna impact us and our um, our privacy, mm -hmm. right? Uh, I'm a cybersecurity uh, technologist. So privacy for me is sure. always a concern, right? Right, right? What I worry about is how, you know, maybe potentially, right? If we're not safeguarding this data, uh, we can be at risk of an attack, right? A cybersecurity attack. Mm -hmm. And that can capture, you know, the data from thousands of people in downtown, right? Mm -hmm. That are walking through the streets, that their face are being is, is being recorded and recognized. So we got to be conscious of that. And talking about, you know, the systems at risk, you know, because we touch on infrastructure as well. Mm. Most of our agencies, their legacy uh, tools that they have, their ERPs are outdated as well. So talking about cybersecurity, we need to do a better job in revamping a lot of the technology systems that we have throughout the city. CPS, for example, SAUCE, uh, VIA, the list goes on. We cannot be at risk right now of an attack, a cybersecurity attack. Uh, which are happening every day. Uh, we see it with the Department of Defense, but we also see it with small businesses and Fortune 500 companies. Mm -hmm. And we're being attacked from China to Russia to multiple countries across the, the world. And so going back to your question, I wouldn't feel comfortable, right, mm -hmm. if that data is uh, compromised. So uh, what are the safeguards that we're going to put in place in the form of cybersecurity that is going to allow the entity, in this case, uh, Central, to protect the information and data from the residents of San Antonio? Right. And I'm afraid this is going to have to be our last question. OK. <laughs> so this it's is been exciting. It's been fun. Right, right, hey, right. Anyway, for, for, the audience, right. for the audience, this is the first one that you have. So I am the experiment. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And I Every think it's working so far. Yeah, I'll if say we, that. If, if there are going to be any screw ups, it's going to be in this one. We're going to fix it. We'll still have five minutes to screw it up. We'll still have five minutes to screw it up. So, yeah. And we'll see if we can do it. All right. This co question comes from uh, Sarah. What do you propose as a solution to the increasing population of people in San Antonio experiencing homelessness. And there's a related yeah, question yeah. Uh, about uh, how you would address uh, San Antonio's kind of burgeoning affordability. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, homelessness is one of the, the, the toughest issues that every major city is experiencing throughout the United States and even throughout the world. Um, yeah, I get a little bit emotional about this issue, right? Because um, Again, I, I walk the Riverwalk and I see a lot of people, some of them passed out on the sidewalks. And mm. it's sad. It really is. I spent last summer with Nikisha Baker from Sand Ministries uh, learning about Sand Ministries. Um, with Better Futures, we did a, a feature. We did a video, an interview with Nikisha. And I got to learn everything about low barrier housing, housing mm. first. I, I think those are the type of programs um, that can rehab people, uh, that can get people off the streets. Mm -hmm. uh, but the, the root cause of homelessness is, is mental health, is drug addiction, right? It's about, I think, and it's on the San Ministry's website, I think it's almost like 50% of San Antonians are one paycheck away from uh, experiencing homelessness. The challenge is that in, in this table right here, Molly, uh, Greg, and I, I, I make the assumption that we have a social home. What is a social home? A social home is, is community, is friends, is family members, that if you can't pay rent, you know you, know you can find a place to, to sleep, a place where you can call home for a week or two or three. And that's not the case from some of the people that are experiencing uh, homelessness. That, that's a reality. Right. And so how do we address that? I would like to see um, more investment and I would like to see uh, 
efforts like low barrier housing, housing first in San Antonio uh, continue to thrive, right? And by that, I mean the city needs to be intentional, right, about these programs. Um, because homelessness is not going to go anywhere, right? And as we continue to grow, uh, we're going to see more of it, right? Uh, let's be realistic about the issue. So we need to be proactive, right? And I think investing in those type of programs is going to help us. And it's just like investing in public safety, right? A large percentage of our budget goes into public safety, right? And so the question is, uh, how can we redirect funds, right? Also of our budget into this type of efforts, because this also becomes a concern of public safety. And we've seen it, we've heard it, right? Some people uh, on the Riverwalk attacking tourists, uh, et cetera, you know, the, 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 you know, you've covered all these stories, right? And so that's my concern. Now, when we talk about housing, um, the average home, and I was just yesterday, we had a, the, the listening and tourist up in the Northwest, and there's this uh, gentleman, his name is Martin Gutierrez. He represents the, the Board of Realtors here in San Antonio. And he was talking about how um, the, the average cost of a home here in San Antonio is about $400,000. That's very high. And in Austin, it's like 700 or something. That's, that's high, right? I mean, that's, that's not affordable. And the challenge is that the, the supply, the stock is not there. And so... I, I, I struggle with the idea of what can be done, right, in terms of, of housing. I think we need more supply. But I would say that um, there's this effort, right, the, the Terry Castillo, the councilwoman, uh, put forward the Unified uh, Development Code, um, which creates these bonus programs as well for, for builders um, and the better utilization of updating the city's existing community land trust program. And I get excited about those type of efforts. And I know that they might be popular or unpopular with a segment of our community, but we need to be bold about uh, solutions. But also with housing, what we cannot forget is that it's also largely driven by the market, right? And you have a lot of uh, financial institutions uh, from banks to uh, uh, financial entities uh, like venture capital groups that are heavily investing in housing, buying the properties and selling them uh, at a higher cost, uh, like BlackRock, for example. And there was an initiative on Congress uh, to address this issue on limiting the ability uh, for these banks to buy multiple uh, residential uh, homes across the United States. I don't know where that uh, congressional effort is at. I don't know if it passed or it didn't, uh, but I know a congressman was pushing for it. These are the type of efforts that I think uh, a mayor can voice and support, right? And so I would like to see uh, more leadership from the mayor, uh, the city council, on voicing these uh, federal proposals that can lower the cost of, of housing in San Antonio. But we must remain competitive, right? And if we wanna attract you know, uh, um, uh, talent to San Antonio, we also need to look at ways where we can uh, support housing. Now, affordable housing, when I think about TOD, for example, that could be also an avenue for more housing. But if we're going to focus on TOD, we also have to be careful in how we thread the needle with the neighborhoods that are uh, going to be disrupted by TOD. And so another component of quality of life that is directly linked to uh, housing is mobility hubs. You can build housing around mobility hubs, which serve as a platform of services related to transportation. By, you mean like a bus stop? No, no, I mean, so so think of, of of mobility hubs as a platform, like your iPhone is a platform, oh, right? Got it, got it. And, and, and yeah. the apps are services. So a mobility hubs, you can Google it, right, uh, are um, platforms where you have multiple last mile connectivity type mm -hmm. of, of transit, right? From, uh, yeah, buses, of course, but also a micro mobility, right? Like the e-trolleys that we see in downtown, mm -hmm. uh, e-bikes, uh, all of that, right? And and you can build housing around that, right? I think uh, Jamaican Plains in Boston is a good example of how they build housing around mobility hubs and TOD. So I'm bullish on how we can get creative and how um, having housing in proximity to transit options would also lower the cost of living for some people that we want to retain or welcome in San Antonio and ultimately improve our quality of life in right. San Antonio. Yeah, yeah. yeah. All right. Uh, that, I'm afraid, is the end of our time. Uh, Beto Altamirano, thank you very much. We, hey, I think this was a good experiment. Important. What do you think? We'll see. We'll see. <laughs> thank you so much. I have to, thank you so much. have to review it. I think it'll be... <laughs> And thank you to the audience members. I, yeah. I saw that we had over 300 people uh, registered. So yeah. I feel honored by the curiosity of everyone who's uh, tuning in to, to listen to what I have to say. 
But I, I remain curious about the future of San Antonio. I remain bullish about the future of San Antonio. And that's why I'm in this race, because I want uh, better healthcare, better education, uh, better opportunities, a better future for San Antonians. And I cannot do it alone. And that's why on this listening to I'm spending time with each neighborhood across the city. Uh, so you can learn more about my platform at BetoForMayor.com or follow me on social media at Beto Altamirano. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>